Hey everyone and welcome to Eco Convos with Dan. I'm really, really excited to bring you our guest today. His name's Scott Taylor. Now Scott's been through so much in his life. He moved up from the, he moved from up, up north, up in the States. He's moved over to Australia now. And we touched upon a little amount of what he's done. Recently in the last number of years, he's gotten involved in permaculture. Now, really, really interesting fella coming from a load of experience. And we also touched on his other hobby, bees. I learned so much about bees I didn't know before. It was fantastic, I'm sure you will too. Listen up, we'll talk to you soon. Hi everyone, welcome to Eco Convos with Dan. I'm your host, Dan Vandal, and we are live here at Century 21 Platinum Agent Studios here in Gympie. And my guest tonight is Scott Taylor. Scott is a formerly American, now an Australian citizen. That's right. So moved, moved to Australia in, was it 90, 97? I moved here in 99. 99? Yeah. Yeah, from Santa Fe. Santa Fe, New Mexico. Yeah, yeah, fantastic. Right. Now, Scott, um, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself, mate? Well, you know, you, so obviously you came from the, came from the States. What, what actually brought you over here? Well, it's a story that probably doesn't fit into this particular conversation, a lot of it, but yeah. uh, some of it was that uh, I had an Australian wife. I okay. married in America. And um, I had uh, uh, her family that, uh, that I wound up sharing a house with there in, 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 uh, in Santa Fe um, were uh, very highly placed in the American permaculture community. Okay. Uh, and they uh, hosted Bill Mollison several times for dinner at the house I was living in. And so I got to meet him at a very personal level, and I don't I knew about permaculture. I'd heard about it you know, more than ten years before, but yeah. I'd never really gotten serious about understanding it. Bill Mollison is one of the, the founders of permaculture, yeah. um, generally considered to be the founder, but it actually was co-founded by Bill Mollison and a fellow by the name of David Holmgren, David Holmgren as well. Now Bill has, uh, had died a few years ago. David's still very active and very yeah. worth. Worth looking into. He's a fascinating right. character. He's, he's um, certainly out there te- teaching a lot still as well, and he's you know, very, very popular on different podcasts and whatnot around the place as well. Um, yeah, yes, to this uh, day, he, he was just interviewed on ABC Radio a couple of days ago. Uh, yeah. He wrote a, a very uh, important book called um, uh, Retro Suburbia, yes. which is about how to reimagine the suburban spaces around cities, which I think is some, something that's going to be of very critical importance in time to come. Very interesting book, actually. So, yeah, so, yeah, yeah. Uh, actually, you yeah, know, springs a lot of interesting ideas. Yes, so. yes. So, uh, Bill Mollison was a dinner guest, <laughs> and and I found that when you know there'd be ten people sitting around the table and they'd be talking permaculture, it's like they were talking a different language. I had yeah. no idea what they were saying. You know, it made no <laughs> sense to me. And I'm I'm pretty well educated and, and, uh, and a great lover of words. So uh, I almost came to the conclusion that I needed to take the permaculture design certification course yeah. in self-defense. Yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> so you could yeah, yeah, get into that conversation as well. Yeah, I wanted to be yeah. part of the conversation. I've been involved in organic uh, gardening for many, many years. So I was yeah. quite familiar with the whole cycles of composting and all that sort of thing and the importance of soil and that. Um, but taking the permaculture design course in Northern California in 1994, yeah, um, it was it was a revelation. It really was. It was one of those kind of moments in life when you realize my path is going to go in a different direction now. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I I took it very. I was very sincere, very serious about it in taking it, even though we were camping in a wet field for two weeks. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, it was at a friend's property uh, who had known Bill for many years, and and uh, so it um, it was a, an amazing group of people. There were almost seventy people who participated. Wow, that's a big group. And it's a big group, that's and really it, big. it varied from I think there were six or eight people who were they call themselves eco gorillas. Yep, and they were part of a, a virtually unknown movement going on in America even today. It's not really particularly well known, and and. They had this amazing system where they would go into the national forests. Yeah. They'd find a great spot, and they would then create and plant a garden yeah. and then move on. And they would set it up so it watered itself, took care of itself, and then they would pass the maps to these gardens around to their tribe. Yeah. So there was this kind of movement going all on all around America among this tribe of going to these remote, off-the-chart places – uh, and they could eat. They could live there. And, it, it, and to me, that was fascinating. That's that's fascinating. Uh, I can see um, governments having issues and, uh, with that and and whatnot. Obviously, 
uh, hence the gorilla, the gorilla aspect to it. Absolutely. But um, that's just such a cool idea. Yeah, and, and you know, nowadays there's you know, there's er, guerrilla urban gardening where people go out and just go into the the, the you know middle strips in the, in in downtown cities and plant fruit trees and things yeah, well, like that. That's that's going on, you know, and and, and yeah. I've heard about quite a bit of it happening in Sydney and Melbourne. Yeah, um, it's, it's actually it's interesting because you've got that happening on a um, you know on an un- underground level as well, but you can you can start seeing uh, that happening in different places with cafes and whatnot as well, and they're actually using that that part of the the footpath and. And those uh, those areas to actually have their herb gardens and have things like that. And I know one of the one of the cafes here, Soma Soma, has got that out the front of their place. You know, the the planter boxes out the front, which yep. are on the on the footpath, are full of her, full of herbs, and uh, and, and you know, anyone can come along and use them. But they use them in the uh, yeah. in the um in the cafes. I, I think it's wonderful. Yeah. So we had had sort of that end of the spectrum. Uh, we had a couple of people from South America who were involved with with. The teaching and uh, and helping of indigenous people yeah. who were being you know inundated by oil companies and all that sort of thing and helping them get systems designed for themselves. We had uh, the CEO of one of the largest fresh juice companies in us in America. Yeah, right. It was one of the students. It was a huge variety of people, and we. I think pretty much I could say that everybody was just sort of lifted up to this new sp- space. Bill was an extraordinary teacher. I'm a, I'm a yeah. great fan of teachers and have done a lot of teaching in my own life. And Bill just had a way about him of telling stories that were so captivating. Yeah. And whether or not they were 100% true didn't really matter. <laughs> <laughs> There's nothing wrong with a bit of an embellishment. He's, I mean, he's yeah. one, of the, one of the great communicators and one yeah. of the great teachers, certainly one of the finest I've ever met. Um, so you got, you got any, any examples of you know, some of the stories that might have been a little bit far off? Well, you know, he would. Uh, uh, he told a story that I, I can't really go into the details of it because it's quite a long story. Yeah, yeah. Um, but you can look it up online. Uh, you can Google yeah. Bill Mollison and the whale. The whale. I think I've heard that one. Because he grew up on the coast of Tasmania, yeah. and and the town had this kind of tradition of dealing with whales that washed up on the beach by basically harvesting them. They, they, yeah. They, and uh, so he tells this story that goes on and on and on, and the characters that he de- describes, and the way the town dealt with with this issue about this whale and this conflict that happened around it is just absolutely hilarious. And the end result is you wind up with this story that talks about people using and living in the natural environment in a very different way than we normally think. So yeah. Bill just had a way. I mean, you know, any topic, whether uh, we were talking about uh, dry land permaculture, desert permaculture. Mm-hmm. And talking about how uh, that there are temperature differentials uh, when the sun goes down in in a desert region where it may be fifty six degrees centigrade, yeah. but there are temperature differentials that can be created by building buildings a certain distance apart. And when okay. that does it, and and with the proper solar orientation, you get a breeze going through there where you can actually create ice. Wow! And in and then he went on to talk about how he knew uh, and and had it demonstrated to him that if you create the little puddle where the water is going to freeze at night with a little bit of a, a, a rise on, in the water, and you put the water in, freezes, you go out and get it at dawn, you can pick it up and you can use, use it as a lens when the sun comes up and light a fire. Wow. Well, it's those that's kind a, of that's things. Amazing. Yeah, that's... It's those kind of things that he would sort of inject into his descriptions of, of how to look at natural systems. It was just captivating, so it's, captivating. It's hard not to get excited about it, really. It is. It really is. I, I was with someone just this afternoon who who had had been very much involved in the in the establishment world. I mean, deeply involved in yeah. the established world. And two years ago, she began paying attention to the climate change issues. Yeah. And rapidly was led to take a permaculture design course, and she completely quit her entire life path. Wow. Completely, and yeah. she bought a piece of property, and she's, she and her mother, yeah. the two of them together, are doing this extraordinary job of taking this little piece of property and turning it into a, a living system that was is going to provide for them completely. Yeah. So it it, it does have a way of really changing your life. You know, it, it's permaculture is a is a way of life. It, it's it's and that's a kind of an interesting understanding about it. Certainly, it's not it's it's a way of life, but it's not just how you live your life, is it? It's true. I mean, there's it's well the the way you see the world and yeah. and understand begin to understand the world becomes very informed. There are specific techniques that permaculture teaches. Not you know 
people tend to think of permaculture as advanced gardening, mm. but it's far more than that. It's one of the better definitions that I know of. It is that it's a toolbox of of design tools yeah. that, as Bill used to say, you, it, it it theoretically should be possible with a proper permaculture education. You could be blindfolded and completely bundled up and given an anesthetic and taken on a plane and dropped into any environment anywhere on the planet and be able to survive, be able to create a living system for yourself. Yeah, well, you've got there's, there's that perfect example of um, Jeff Lawton over, over in Jordan and the, his, his Green in the Desert project. You know, that's such a per- perfect example of that. Yeah, it had nothing to do with a, a subtropic environment, that, which no. is sort of where he grew up, but, but instead you're giving... Given the tools and and the techniques and you you that you gradually learn, it it, it makes it so that you can understand systems a lot better. Yeah, and uh, and that that was really where my fascination comes in is is on into systems into the pattern language that he talks about uh, about uh, just the way that we can orient ourselves on the planet so that as Bill liked to. <laughs> Bill had a way of every session, and we did two sessions a day for two weeks. At every session, at the beginning of every session, he gave an entirely different definition of what permaculture is. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and one of them that really stuck in my mind, one that I've always really enjoyed, is that permaculture is the endless pursuit of hammock time. <laughs> <laughs> and which is a very interesting it's, thing. Is it's a little bit deeper than it sounds. Yeah, yeah. Because the three key principles of of permaculture are um, care for the earth, yep. care for humans, and sharing the abundance. Yeah. Right? So the idea of hammock time is really very much about taking care of human beings. Yeah. And that's often overlooked. Permaculture has become and can easily become uh, this kind of a, a campaign to look after the earth so that earth will then take care of feeding us. Yeah. But it's so much more than that. It really is so much more. Really, really does promote that community, doesn't it? Well, and that that sort of is the is the 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 other overlooked aspect of it, and that is how do we deal with with a reimagining of of community? How do yeah. we stimulate ourselves to care for each other? You know, the, in in uh, the permaculture design uh, manual, which is yeah. sort of the bible of permaculture. Uh, which, by the way, I would I would have to point out that many many people who go out and buy the book that it's very expensive to yeah. buy and then sit down and and try to read it from page one they get very frustrated before they get a hundred pages in <laughs> yeah absolutely I think it's, it's one, of, one of those things you can you, you hear the you hear the term I, I know I, I certainly did I, I heard the term permaculture first and I thought oh, what's that and I asked the people the people who were talking about it and they explained a little bit and then so you start jumping on jumping online as you do and and you, we popped it into their computer and, and all, all of a sudden it just came out with so much information. It was just so highly confusing but also extremely daunting to actually get started, to actually know what on earth it was about. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I can't, can't recommend highly enough the, the importance of, of finding people that you like yeah. uh, who know something about it and have them show you yeah. what it's about and not just tell you but to show you what it's about. And then uh, we'll find a local permaculture design course. We call it a PDC. Yeah. It's actually permaculture design certification course. Yeah. yeah. Um, so by doing a PDC, you will have this very, very thoroughly and carefully uh, planned out uh, systematic introduction into this kind of thinking and and how the pieces fit together. You know? Yeah. I mean, we talk about things like invisible systems. You know? We're not just talking about trees and how trees grow and how soil does what it does, but there is the invisible systems that human beings live within. We create systems of, of trust and economies and that kind of thing. So, I mean, you know, one of the things that Bill pointed out is he says, I still don't understand. He said, I may never understand why those of us who are involved in the ecological arts and that sort of thing yep. have not actually banded together to tell a major automobile manufacturer exactly the kind of vehicle that we want yeah. everything from its repairability to its use of materials to the kinds of, of uh, you know systems that need to be on board he said why haven't we done that he said there are millions of us and we yeah. are a real market and we should be able to get together and agree on what that vehicle looks like and tell them that that's what we want yeah, yeah. he said but we don't do that it really is a um uh 
the, the, that's the pure example of the human condition, isn't it? Yeah. It is. It is. Yes, we're we're very much. Um, you know, I, I don't want to fall into the uh, you know uh, uh, raising my fist about how bad we're being treated by the yeah. overlords or something like that. Yeah. It's not like that. It's just it's just a, a system that is is. Um, uh, it's pervasive. It is very well marketed. It is yeah. f- supported by government institutions. It's supported by educational systems. It's easy to live within because it's all right there and handed to you, and more yeah. and more so with the internet. It, so it's quite easy to fall into a an, a, an organized uh, human culture yeah. um, that actually has close the door on our creativity. You know, there's an interesting question in, in, the, in the realm of education these days about, yeah. you know, how, inv- how valuable is boredom? Yeah, yeah. We've always insisted that you must fill every moment of a child's life with activities because they're going to need that in their adult life. Yeah, mom, but dad, it's in I'm boredom bored. that creativity yeah. is born. Yeah, yeah. So it's, it's things like that that we, we need to be uh, sensitive to and yeah. be aware of and, and find ways to deal with. Okay, so I think that brings, that, that starts, starts bringing us forward to and then another point where everything, everything is provided for us as, as people. You know, we've got everything there as a, on a silver platter, essentially. But so many people are actually taking a step back now. Which you know we're starting to see people actually do make you know make moves towards you know living more um, more carefully, you know taking actual steps to actually be a bit more responsible for what they're doing, and that's been something I know I've certainly noticed that you know in, in my industry and people saying you know we're moving out of the cities and we're wanting to do something a little bit more yes. um, you know along these lines. What do you think that is? What do you, what do you think it is that's actually making people say, well, hang on, we've we've got all this here, but we want to. Do something a little bit different, a little bit off, maybe off center. Well, I would say that it's <laughs> you, you could almost say, well, let's take a little, let's do a little permaculture analysis of the the, the topic of climate change. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And the surprising thing is that permaculture would actually say, well, what climate are you talking about? You're talking about the climate that exists within our culture. Yeah. Where we depend on certain things to produce a, the the rain of resources that we then draw upon, you know, and are we actually facing a, a a crisis in terms of the cultural climate in which we live? And I think we are, yeah. and I think people are become becoming sensitized to that, just as they're becoming sensitized to how much we're actually putting into the air, you yeah. know, and 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 how oh, how the waters are and. You know, when, when it was pointed out recently that uh, on a long drive across the countryside, yeah. it was not long ago, and I think this is, I, I wasn't here, but I'm assuming it's also, it was also true in Australia as much as it is in America. Yeah. Any long drive you took, every time you stopped for petrol, you had to clean the windshield of insects well, that had bugs, been smashed on the windshield. Yeah. And it was a, it was a chore, you know, because they were, and they, because there'd be hundreds of them. Yeah. Now... You can drive from here to Melbourne, and you might find five or ten insects on the that's, windshield. That's a really interesting point because you do see it. Like, uh, I mean, I, I certainly notice it. You know, driving a lot, but I notice it when um, when it's you, you when it does happen, or when uh, you do get a lot of bugs on your windscreen. You do you are you are cleaning them off and going, geez, there was a lot there. You're actually noticing it rather yeah. than just being. Just you know, taking just it one as, of those as things. the way it's, it is. Yeah, yeah. 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 So it, it's those kind of things which are, I mean, we can become aware of it, just yeah. as you said, or it becomes, a, it sort of drops into the subliminal zone. But those things are adding up, and we're starting to actually see for ourselves in our immediate personal experience yeah. that things are changing. Yeah. And the added information that is coming to us so powerfully, people like Greta Thunberg, I mean, she brings a, 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 an innocence and a yeah. power and a wisdom and an insight and intelligence and research yeah, yeah. into these messages that when we sit there honestly and openly and listen to, we go, oh my God, she's right. How yeah. dare you, she said. Yeah, yeah. And, Which, and that, it's, 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 it's interesting seeing the reaction, the, re- the reaction to Greta Thunberg and, and what the... Uh, you know, some some people absolutely one hundred percent support, but the the one, the people who don't really really don't support what she's doing. That's right. No, they take it very much as a threat, as but, the way it appears. Yeah. So what you know what 
why is it that people are taking a step back? I think it's because we are we we can no longer ignore it. It really yeah. is in our face. It's in our life. It's affecting things. Yeah. yeah. So, so so if we if we if we go back to um go back to how people are making those changes. You know, one of the, one of the things I, I know that um that you know you've you've come come in and you've you've created you know uh, you, you know, moved a couple of times, but as as you're going through and check, changing you know the properties that you're in, you're you're going through and you're improving yeah. what was there to begin with. Um, you know, one of the things I I became really fascinated with you about we we started talking about bees, you know. So you've you've been you've been keeping bees yep. as well, yeah. You know, so you know, one of probably the most important you know, insects in the world, you know. Um, you, you know, tell us a little bit a little bit how you got into uh, how you got into bees in the first place and where things are at now. Yeah, well, it sort of came along with the person who introduced me to permaculture in 1983. Uh, he had just come back from living in Australia, and he we met for the first time yeah. over a completely different subject. But he, when, when he spent some time with me and began looking and seeing what I was doing in my little suburban lifestyle there, he said, you know, there's a name for what you're doing in, in Australia. I said, what's that? I said, is it like organic gardening? He said, no, 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 it's a whole different thing. It's called permaculture. Yeah. Well, what is that? And he very briefly said, well, it's a system that helps you to be able to look at the world and actually see what's going on. You know, you look at a stream and you can tell just by looking at it which side is going to have the fertile soil on, which side is going to be scoured you know, down to gravel. Yeah. He said, oh, you, can, you can see the effects of erosion. You can see what the, the, the progression of plants in, across the landscape. He said, it gives you a whole different way of understanding the world around you. And I thought, oh, that's pretty fascinating. I, I'd yeah. like to get into that. One of the things that he uh, talked to me about was a friend of his who had spent time in Africa yeah. and had seen the way uh, people in Kenya particularly were dealing with bees and beekeeping. Yeah. And he got quite fascinated by it and, and studied what they were doing and came back to America and was one of the very first people to propose an entirely different way of keeping bees in what's called a top bar hive. Okay, which is, so you're going to have to explain that a little bit. Okay, a, t- a, a top bar hive. We typically think of a, a beehive, a bee, you know, as a stack of rectangular boxes. Yes. Right? And so a top bar hive is like a horizontal box, one long horizontal box, that instead of each box having a wooden frame inside, yeah. in which there is wax that is given to the bees, and they then build a comb on the sides of the wax and put honey in the comb. Yeah. Instead of that, you have this box with with wooden bars across the top, and that's all. There is no frame attached to the bar, so it's only the top bar. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so, so is, is, then the, the bees then have to build their own habitat. They there. build everything, and yeah. but... Because the bar, the top bar hive is built with uh, the sides at a 120 degree angle, which is the same as the angle of the cell in a honeycomb. Yeah, the bees actually build the comb so that it doesn't touch the sides of the box. Oh wow! Quite fascinating that they yeah. do that. So th- uh, there's a certain kind of design that you can do to build a certain dimensions that you can create a, a space in which bees uh, are very happy to be, and they build their own comb. And so this was fascinating to me. I, I was interested in it just that the idea that bees could act that way. So that yeah. was my first introduction to bees. And then later on, and I always wanted to kind of know more about and be around beekeeping. It didn't have much chance. And then I moved to a property in uh, uh, not far from here. Yeah. And um, one of the things that attracted me to buying this property was that there were three beehives on it. I yeah. thought, great, here's my chance. Wait, here I go. I'll go for it. Right you know? So moved on to this property and, and uh, got settled in. And a couple of months later, I went down and took a look at the hives. And I thought, oh, these don't look like they've even been touched for a couple of years. So... I looked around and I found a, a local, some local experts had them come and look at them, and they said, "Oh no, these are actually very, very healthy. You're, there's a lot of honey in here, and and uh, this is great. You know, they're doing great. And here's some things that you can do to make it better." I said, "Okay, great." So I got into it, and it was very cumbersome. It was very awkward. I was not, I had no none of the grace, and I had none of the the special skills that one develops around bees. Um, and, and quickly began to realize, I really want to see how that top bar system works. Because this was these are just the traditional hives. Yeah, yeah. So I then spent a couple of months studying everything I could find about top bar hives and compiled 
the various attributes and design details and that sort of thing and built to. I was I used to be a furniture maker for so many years. Yeah. And um, so it was no big, big deal for me to build these two, two top bar hives and then managed to get bees into them and began to observe the difference between the top bar and the, and the standard what are called Langstroth hives. Okay. Um, and that was quite fascinating to me. I joined the local bee group. And um, when I first started asking people what they knew about top bar hives, they said, well, we don't know much about them at all. Would you tell us about them? So I yeah. got up at several of the meetings and talked about it. And it, it almost developed into the, the uh, monthly comedy routine of me telling all the mistakes <laughs> I was making. And people were just falling out listening yeah, yeah. to the stories that I was telling. And, so and it was fun. I was quite happy with that because it was, um, it was a great opportunity yeah. to, to talk about how in a way, not, how not to do things. And, um, you know, I eventually had to learn that there is such a thing as bee time. Okay. That um, the speed at which you move yeah. has a great deal to do with how aggressive they are. Because if they see you acting as uh, some kind of an aggressor yeah. or attacker or as some kind of a danger because of the speed at which you're moving... Yeah, they will sting you. Hence, hence, as you said, became you, you weren't graceful to start with. Absolutely not yeah. at all. In fact, my whole because I was anxious about what I was doing and I was scared and I didn't really know what I was doing. I'd yeah. open up the hives and I'd immediately that. take my scraping tool and start scraping off all the off all the, the bits of wax that were not where they should be. Yeah. And they just saw that as somebody coming in and just tearing our house apart, you know. <laughs> and then there's the the be time thing as well, the the speed at which you move. So. Uh, I decided from the very beginning that I wanted to keep track of how many times I got stung. Yeah. And in the first four years of my beekeeping, I was stung 426 times. Now, it's... Well, now that's considerably less than one a day, so that's... <laughs> <laughs> well, when you consider that you, you typically do that about every two to three weeks, you know, as, okay, some yeah. of the times I'd get stung 35 times in one oh, session. No. And it was, luckily I'm not allergic. I was going to say, you'd find out very quickly. Uh, but I were. did get some stings that were, were just absolutely incredibly painful and swole up, you know, part of my face. And I mean, I, I'd get bees inside my 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 hood. Yeah. And, and, uh, and that's, that's really baffling of what to do because if you turn the, take the hood off, you're exposing yourself more, yeah. but you can't have bees crawling around on your face. Who so are then you're panicking you. and they're panicking because they're stuck and it's a, yeah, it's a lose, lose situation, isn't it? Yeah. So, <laughs> you know, so part of what was, was funny, uh, was in the comedy routine was just, you know, that they were seeing these silly mistakes that I was making and they were gentle and, and, and very kind in, in helping me to, uh, get that Maybe. sorted out. Yeah, so Scott, uh, you know, it's one of the, one of those things. There's obviously so many different um, you know, uh, reasons we have bees and you know, benefits to having bees from you know pollination and just you know plant health for us physically as well. You know, for people who wanted to get into bees, you know, how, how do they how do they go about it? Well, first consider what kind of bees you're really interested in. There are the native bees uh, in Australia alone. There are over 1,600 species of yeah. native bees. Some of them don't look like bees at all. They yeah. look like wasps or they look like flies, but they're actually bees. Some are very tiny. And some that look like flying ants as well. Yeah, as yeah, well. they do. Um, so if you're interested in the native bees, then I would say... Um, try to read up on them. Yeah. You can look into what are called solitary bees, and then there are called stingless bees. Yeah. Um, I'm assuming this is going to be mostly Australians who will be listening to this, so I'll talk about that. We'll see how we go. Yeah. <laughs> but um, uh, the typically, like here in Gympie, the, the Valley Bees group um, yeah. has a very strong emphasis on all kinds of bees. So that means that we have workshops on uh, native bees, whether they're stingless or, or uh, solitary bees. So yeah. how to build hives for them, um, how to attract them, um, how to care for them. Um, there's really only uh, really about, I guess I'd have to say one variety of native bee in Australia that ha produces any significant amount of honey. Yeah. And even that is tiny. Yeah, You're yeah. talking about maybe a couple of tablespoons a year. Yeah, and they're they called the sugar bag bees, and yeah. sugar bag honey is like nothing you've ever eaten before. It is different it's, from from honey, uh, that normal honey, and it is exquisite. It's absolutely amazing taste, and it's it's yes. it's. I, I had I did have had, have tried some once before, and uh, it's just you know it's it's indescribable, but it's it is so far away from what you would traditionally think of as honey, you know. Um, but the benefits of having you know the wild bees, the, the native bees, sorry, is obviously 
you know, you, you, your, um, your pollination. Yes, yeah, so that their their pollination, of course, is going to be primarily of uh, of native plants, native yeah. native plants. So uh, the the honeybee is is actually an import. It does come from uh, you know uh, the Caucasus Mountains is probably the origin of the honeybee that we know. Okay. Um, but there are great varieties. There's a Russian variety. There's an Italian variety. There, I think, is a Turkish variety. Um, but the, the, those bees have been spread around the world, and and for obvious reason, because one can think of bees as being like livestock, yeah. you know, and and they actually are classified that by that typically under legislations. Um, they um, they are an entirely different um, category of, of of creature, really, than than the native bee, yeah. and they're the ones that we can work with. So that the the surplus of honey that they produce is available to us. Yeah. Um, yes, you can buy bees. Uh, there yeah. are people who sell what are called a nuke. A nuke is in, spelled N U C. Yeah. It's short for nucleus. Yeah. It's, it's, so if you think of a colony of bees, which is which you know a typical full size colony is going to be uh, thirty to fifty, sixty thousand bees. Yeah. A nucleus is going to be a queen and workers and and uh, and foragers, um, and it's going to be several frames that have. Uh, the brood, which is the, 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 the eggs that are laid that are gradually developing into bees. Um, so it's, it's only going to be like four or five frames in a small, narrow box. And you can buy those from people who produce bee, bees you know, yeah. colonies. Uh, and you take that nuke and you put that into your own hive box. And you protect it and you care for it and you look after it. And hopefully you put it in a good position for it. And they will then begin to rapidly uh, reproduce and you'll yeah. start getting more and more more bees so that's one way you can do it another way you can do it is to to um, uh, collect a swarm and you you sometimes see you know, fairly often actually in the springtime you see these news reports of somebody that went to their car in downtown Melbourne or something and the whole car is covered with bees and yeah. they're you know they're calling the fire department or something like that those people get terrified of that yeah. and they run and they t- always say oh so there were only so many people were stung but it's probably unlike. It's pr- fairly unlikely that actually anyone was stung because people the, when bees are in a swarm, they're in the process of separating from the ho- the co- a hive that they were in. So the old queen yeah. recognizes that she's coming toward the end of her life, and she then starts making signs through her pheromones that that trigger the other bees to take one of her eggs and start producing a queen out of it. Yeah, in right. fact, they will produce like five or six queens. And they do that by feeding them only royal jelly. They, you know, okay. so every, ro- every bee ro- is royal, fed royal jelly. Ro- royal jelly for two days, and then they're fed honey and they're fed, fed pollen and that sort of thing. To create a queen, they feed the only royal jelly. So they will produce so, about so five or six of them. And when they're about to be born, the queen, believe it or not, she makes a sound. And it's been recorded, and it sounds almost like a duck quacking. It's quite a hilarious a little yeah. sound. She makes this sound, and the bees who understand that that's their role will then follow her, and she will leave the hive. Now, she hasn't flown in probably four or five years, so she can't fly very far. So yeah. it may be only, you know, maybe 50 meters or something, and often not even that far, followed by half or sometimes even more than half the colony. And they will go and land on something, and, and that's what people see that's, you know, on a car. Now, yeah, those yeah. bees are not defensive. They're not aggressive. They're not, yeah. They have no hive, no colony to protect. Their only attention is on the queen and herself. So you can actually literally, with if you can do it with, without even gloves on, and I have done it, you can literally put your hands into a, that ball of bees that's hanging yeah. on something and just hold them in your hand, and then you can yeah. gently drop them into a box. I've seen, seen people do that. You see that, see that on, um, on different videos around it and things like that. But okay, so just, just if we were to take it back one, one step, Roy, royal jelly. <laughs> that's not like airplane jelly, is it? Uh, it no, it's not. It, it, it's... <laughs> um, it's um, it's a special product that uh, that uh, bees produce, and uh, people have gone so far as to collect it and, cl- and put, include it in cosmetics and things, which, as far as I can tell, has no positive human effect at <laughs> yeah, all. Okay. It's actually special bee food, and that's what it is. You know. Yeah, right. <laughs> okay. I, I just I, I'd never heard that before. I'm sure a lot of people hadn't either. either yeah, no. Well. It, it, it's no. In, in tiny, tiny amount. So, do you, do you know what it is specifically, or is is it just something that? The bees, the, the bees know how to, know to produce. Yeah, they know how to produce it. 
I, no, I, I can't tell you much about about that. Uh, where uh, you know there are there are what are called there's a phase that bees go through. Every bee that's born actually goes through a number of different phases of of the role that they play in in the hive. Yeah. You have nursery bees, and you have cleaner bees, and you have uh, ones who are who deal only with sort of building and because they produce wax out of their bodies. I mean, we can, we can go way 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 yeah, into yeah, the yeah, subject okay. of bees here, and that's it's that, really too much. That could get what I would say yeah. that if people are interested in the honeybee world. Find your local bee group. There will be one in your community, yeah. whether it's informal or a formal one. One that that uh, that uh, is is um, you know well organized and runs the teaching programs. May may have a, an open day where where people come to a sort of like a, a like a little bee festival, you know, once a year. That sort of thing. Find a group like that. In in Gympie, we have the Mary Valley Bee Group. Yes, um, and you know there's a lot of sponsorship that we we do uh, free trainings uh, two times a month at Landcare yeah. in, in both native bees and honeybees. Um, so there, that's the best way. Hang yeah. out with people who have bees, and they can show you and tell you all about it. So you know, so when you, when you get bees bees at your place, I know uh, you were mentioning mentioning earlier how, how happy your neighbors were that you had had your bees. You know, you were worried that they were going to be a little bit uh, apprehensive about it, but you know, all, all of a sudden. Their flowers are blooming. Their, their, their gardens are going exceptionally well. So, you know, at, at, at your place, you know, do, do you run a combination of the hives that you were talking about? I do, yeah. So I have both of them. Um, uh, I had a problem that I, I don't really know the reason for where one of the top bar hives, uh, all the bees died. They just disappeared. They yeah, were, right. were from within a three-day period, they just suddenly disappeared. Um, and uh, I, it, my conclusion really in, in my analysis of the – Relative benefits and uh, of that of the two systems is that the top bar hive is is uh, there's a lot of hype around it. There's a lot of yep. sort of marketing about how wonderful they are because it's different. It's something different. And people talk about it as natural bee, beekeeping. Uh, to me, that's completely false. There, there are there are as many problems, if not more, problems with the top bar hive than there is with the Langstroth system. It is so highly developed, it's so sophisticated, it deals with so many of the real details. That one needs to to take care of the Langstroth yeah. system. So um, uh, you know the top bar hive. Yeah, there's they don't produce as much honey. They produce yeah. much more wax than they produce honey. Um, to actually get the honey, you have to cut the comb off the bars and then crush it with your hands. And uh, as as now I'm starting to be an older person, my hands are just too stiff to do that. Yeah, yeah. So there, there are just a lot of issues around the, the um, top bar hive, and it's not standardized either. Either, so you're unlikely to be able to find parts from somebody else to fix yours. Yeah, yeah. So you, if you if you're handy and you can build your own, and you want to do the experiment, and it's just something that you find fascinating, go for it. Yeah. Do, do check it out. Some people really do love the top bar hive system. I found it to just really not suit my my interests. And yes, absolutely, the neighbors just have gone. They're they're so happy because their gardens are producing at least twenty five percent more because suddenly they've got all this pollination going on. Fantastic! So the h- honeybees are attracted to the exotic plants that we typically have in our gardens, whereas okay. native bees aren't so attracted. Yeah, yeah. All right. So so bringing that back back to your place, you know, you've been you know practicing practicing permaculture for a number number of years now. Um, you know, you in in your in your in your place and in your experience of what what you've um what you what you've gone through over the years. What are some of the pitfalls you found? You know, it's, it's, there's, there's no such thing as a perfect system. Well, that's true. And, and uh, I think when people approach permaculture, they think, oh, I'm now going to get the recipe for how to, do, uh, to raise food perfectly and, and produce my own energy and, and uh, manage water in the environment and all that sort of thing. But permaculture was never meant to be a prescription. It's never meant to be a recipe. It's meant to be a toolbox. So As it's up, to, before, it's up yeah. to you to apply those tools. You need to get f- proficient with the tools, which is about observation. It's about uh, understanding where to get information and then how to apply that information. So permaculture is actually one step back from the whole idea of the recipe. Yeah. And but but still, over time, there have been a lot of lists of trees that are ideal permaculture trees. Okay. Have produced or uh, plants that really should be planted next to other plants or and people have taken that again as a as a shopping list yeah that bible this is what you need to do yes yeah. and that's that's one of the mistakes that people often will make and they will they'll they'll practically hurt themselves working so hard to try to apply 
one of these lists to their property. Now their property may have frost, yeah. and you're putting, you're involved, you're, you're planting trees that absolutely will not produce fruits with frost. Yes, and so you spend ten years nurturing these trees, and you watch them grow, and you watch them flower, and you watch them start to produce fruit, and year after year after year, they mm. never produce anything. That's because there's been a, 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 a there's a gap in the understanding of how to observe the, your, the system you're in, and yeah. one of them is about you know, one of the ways that one should introduce yourself to a property if you're thinking about buying or developing a property is first of all camp on it. Yep. I'm not I'm not talking about putting a camper. I mean getting on the ground and sleeping on the ground. Yeah. Feel what the cold is like in the morning. Does it come creeping across the ground or is it just sort of generally there? You know, Bill used to talk about actually tasting the soil. I'm not sure yeah. how many people are going to be. Oh, I've, actually, I've actually seen same people do that. Yeah, I've actually yeah. seen people do that at properties before. Yeah. So 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 it the the act of observation needs to be ongoing. And mm. then how do you get information about where you are? You need to observe the 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 way animals move across the property. You need yeah. to discover who the children are in the neighborhood because they're going to know where all those secret places are. Of course. Try to find the old timers because they're going to know the history. They're going to be able to tell you, yeah, actually 30 years ago, this place right here was really, really wet. We had lots yeah. of rain. Now we don't have that. You know, it, it's, it's, the, it's the experience that you can draw upon. So how to gather information and apply that and then how to scale what it is that you're doing so that you're not trying to do a big thing in a place that can't support that big thing yeah, or taking on too big a property. Bill was always telling people, take on the smallest garden space you can because you will manicure every single leaf and you will get so much production out of that little balcony in your, in your city apartment yeah. as, as uh, other people. Everybody wants to have a quarter of an acre garden. Yeah. Yeah, and they're yeah. going to exhaust themselves, and they're going to wind up having these enormous harvests that they can't preserve or deal with. It's going to become uh, rather uh, overwhelming and possibly even depressing and may even lead to you giving up permaculture altogether yeah. and describing it as a failed system, which That's it right. isn't. Because you end, end up with so much waste. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So a- permaculture has, has a way of, of, uh, of creating so much enthusiasm for it that one yeah. can really overdo it. Certainly. So I really advocate taking it slow and easy, um, observe very well, get to know the old-time permaculture people in your community and find yeah. out how they're doing things and hang out with them. And they will give you, they, they will give you advice that is priceless right. and, and you will never find in a book. Scott, I think that's just a perfect time to start you know, looking at wrapping things up, mate. That's just been your you goal full of information. And, um, <laughs> you know, we could... Talk, talk for hours, which we have. So, yeah. yeah. So, so Scott, I just got um, I go, go through and ask everybody six questions. We have our six in sixty. Yep. So six questions that we go through, nice and uh, nice and fast. Um, and yeah, we've got six, 60 seconds to get through all six of them. So okay. You ready to go? Uh, yeah, sure. Yep. Okay. Uh, uh, first up, what's a personal habit that contributes to your success? Um. I think it's. I think everybody has the uh, certain kinds of obsessions, yep. things that they're particularly fascinated by, and if you can harness your obsessions, yep. then you've got a horse that'll take you anywhere right. that you so, need to go. So get obsessed. Love it. Yeah, it's the best advice you've ever received. <laughs> Someone pointed out to me that smart is not necessarily wise. Love it. <laughs> That's, um, what's the one thing you're most fired up about today? Oh, I think uh, how to, um, for myself, it's about finding a way to, to share the legacy of experiences that I have. Yeah. So that what I have gone through, some of which is I've paid for at a very high price, yeah. uh, becomes a, a resource for others so that they don't have to take those uh, wandering paths. Yeah. So it's about my legacy, really. Your legacy. Love it. That's good. Yeah. Um, What's one one book or podcast you would recommend to our listeners? Well, just about you can find out about permaculture online and so readily. There's so much information out there. Yeah. I want to lean towards something which is going to be largely unknown, and it's a beautiful, beautiful book written by a friend of mine, as a matter of fact. His name is Jim Nolman, N-O-L-L-M-A-N, and the book is simply Why We Garden. It's an extraordinary book. It take huh. it, you can t- take a year gradually reading your way through it because there's so much to absorb. It's so That's beautiful. Right. It's a very gentle and a, and a beautiful, beautiful book. 
we'll have the link to it link, link to it in our in our uh, in our story notes. And um, okay, so what personal goals are you hoping to achieve over the next twelve months? Uh, well, the, the the property that I've just moved on to, I've been there for seven months. is uh, It's in need of having some of the systems really well established, and they're not established yet. So my goal is to get those systems fully functioning, which is then going to give me hammock time. Perfect. Okay. <laughs> so la- last question. Uh, you have a cat, right? A cat. Yes. Yes. Okay. So if if you could ask your cat three questions, what would they be? <laughs> Uh, what do you see when you look at me uh, at, without blinking? <laughs> Why do you stare at me? <laughs> <laughs> yep, okay. So that would be one. Another is um, what, uh, what is it like for you uh, to sit in the, in the driveway at dusk completely still for 20 minutes? Yep. I know that cats, you know, we, we know that dogs can hear, you know, much more, three times higher than humans can. Yeah. And cats can hear three times higher than dogs can. Yeah. So they're hearing that, yeah. a world that we can't even imagine. That's, that's fascinating. Okay. All right. Number three. Yep. Third one. We, oh, we uh, got one more question, isn't it? I think I'm sure you had one more question. That was two. Um, one was okay. Well, I'm sure I'll go with another one. Now. Go with another one. Uh, what's it like walking around in a fur suit all the time? <laughs> <laughs> That's perfect, Scott. Mate, uh, we, we could talk for hours about this, and I really, really appreciate your time today. And, um, yeah, mate, that's been absolutely fantastic. We're going to have uh, links to all the, to the, the various uh, things you've spoken about in your, in your, um, uh, in, in this uh, interview tonight. Yep. And, um, so we're going to have all those links in the, in the story notes. And, uh, and, or through the social media and all those channels and whatnot. And, um, there's also one one more thing that you had had mentioned that you wanted to uh, you wanted to share as well was was there's a, a, a video you got from from Bill Mollison as well that you wanted to share. So I'm going to have that on the story notes as well. Yes. So we've got a link there for people to be able to see that. Yeah. But, it, it's actually uh, 15 videos. Uh, right. It's, series, it's series an of entire videos. PDC by Bill. Yeah. It was taught in uh, in a drylands area in Texas in in America. So there's a there's sections of it that aren't necessarily applicable to live. You know the, the environment that we yeah. live in yeah. here. But I strongly recommend you watch them anyway because there's all those incredible stories that Bill tells. That, that, that's absolutely brilliant. So look, I will certainly be adding those links to it. And um, thank you so much for joining us. I really, thank really you very much for the opportunity, Dan. I really appreciate it. Mate, it was wonderful. So mate, um, all, all the best, and to everybody out there listening. Thank you, Scott, and um, we'll talk to you later. Yeah. I never knew of a thing called Royal Jelly. Oh my God, what a great chat. Scott, thank you so much, mate. Everybody make sure you like, share and subscribe. Look forward to talking to you soon.